Welcome back everyone to the Underwater Tribe live show Friday it is. Happy Friday everyone, Happy. welcome back. The weekend is just there. The weekend <laughs> is there, in fact today felt like a weekend. Yes, already? Yeah. Okay. Because so. I tried to go to the bank this morning and evidently it was closed. Yes, because today it's is evidently a holiday. It's public holiday. What for? Yeah. I wouldn't really know. <laughs> I have no idea but either. Something like we have an addition in the studio right now today. It's happening. You want to see? You want to see what's happening? Our frogfish here. It got a little buddy. Yes. Now we got two of them. Yes. Do you know how when they mate frogfish, they do like this? So which one is the male? Which one's the female? Big one is female. Definitely. Can you see? That's a male. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to have another entertaining show for you. A very, very good interview. We have an interview with uh, Alex uh, Chapuis and uh, Mark uh, Crane coming up. Yes. Yes. Alex and Mark. Uh, well, Mark and Alex. Alex and Mark. Mark and Alex. Alex and Mark. Uh, they are doing some research uh, underwater in very deep water here with yes. rebreathers they go down in uh, in the east coast of bali and uh, they check uh, fish life uh, coral life potential cleaning station down at depth at that depth lots of depth yes 100 meters 120 meters 100 meters 120 very have you been to 100 meters I've never been to uh, 100 meters. You're one of those Red Sea people that had the 100 meter club. Ah, yes. There you know, was they would go, meters. they would go, they would, they would guide yeah. in the morning or whatever, and then go out for a 100 meter dive in the afternoon. That's right. Are you one of those people? No, but I knew a few, and, uh, but I was always, uh, I was one of the shark guys. Okay. So every time there was uh, like a shark coming out uh, on the surface, somewhere close to the boat, big sharks, yep. we would jump in the water. Right. Whatever it is, you always jump. You don't care about it. That's Red Sea. How is Tahiti style? Tahiti style? No, there was not really any depth. Too much current there. Too much current. Mm. Mm. You don't want to go down. No way. If yeah. you're down 100 meters, you've done something mm. wrong. Yeah. You've drifted the wrong way in the channel. <laughs> down you go. Yeah. But I imagine also like down there, like a Tahiti must be oh, still yeah. like clear and uh, lots of light. Yeah, uh, lots of sharks out there. Yes. So before we jump right into the interview. Before. Before we do that. The weekend is coming. Okay, but then are we going to come back next week? We are going to come back on Monday. Monday. It's going to be us. And we're going to start something new on Monday. We're going to start a segment about Raja Ampat itself. Instead of bringing you the whole uh, Raja Ampat in uh, one uh, segment. That's too many, too uh, too much many stuff places. in Raja. We're going to go like different areas every Monday. We're going to give you a little bit more of uh, Raja Ampat and the insights. Photography. Yep. Videos. What you can uh, see. Maps. Uh, what you will see when you join us in Raja Ampat. We've got uh, then on Wednesday, we have Douglas Seifert, world famous photographer. It is Wednesday, Douglas, no. yes. No. We, ha we have Jason Isley on Wednesday. Ah, yes, Jason Isley on Wednesday, yeah. sorry. And Seifert. Another world famous photographer. And Douglas will be on Friday. Douglas will be on Friday, that's correct. So two very uh, um, fantastic underwater yeah. photographers coming up. Talented, well-known very good long time photographers. Yes. Today, I don't want to spoil it, but today you need to log in to our Facebook page. Guys, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure that you also tune in on Facebook later on because we are going to release a very funny video that we recorded uh, uh, yesterday. Ah, are we? Uh, with our instructor Parma. Are we doing that today? We are going to do that today. Nice. So then people, it's like a quiz and you will have a chance to answer. Uh, over the weekend and then on Monday we will bring that up and we will check that out. Cool. Yes. I think also today, for those of you last week, week before, we were talking about the the under bath water photo competition that uh, Fourth Element is putting out. Today is your last day to get your photos in there. So if you're interested in, you know, you've been doing some creative things at home with your underwater photography, today's your last day to enter it. It's yeah. a good, kind of a cool competition. I like the idea. Should see some original cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, I saw some very good pictures yeah. already. And we also have frogfish here. So we should go in the bath and well, we put them in. We could do the sink. We could do it in the sink. With all the camera that we show in the last segment <laughs> that we have. All, all the cameras are here. We, have all, we don't have a bathtub here. Right. And in case you missed that uh, last minute, uh, what was it? Like a last minute live show that we did just yesterday. We did. 
that also like is quite interesting. We had a few people. Uh, we had a few people join us. We we didn't promote it. It was kind of a, a, a last minute thing. We we're also starting a new series right now where we're talking about underwater photography. So it's not going to be a live session like what we're doing now. What it is instead will be targeted tutorials. Each we're, we're not going to say we're going to do them every week, but. We're going to put them in a separate uh, context, so it'll be an under a live underwater tutorial session yeah. that we'll try and do at least once a week, um, and it's for beginners, those who are new to underwater photography, those who are thinking about getting into photography, things like that. Uh, we we posted the live show yesterday or uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday. But what we're going to do, we're also going to clean that up and put it into our YouTube channel and yeah. our Facebook channel in its own separate little compartment. Mm -hmm. So we'll announce that uh, soon. They're still a little bit rough, but yeah. we're uh, we're working on those, and those will be a great way for people to learn uh, all the tricks of the trade in yes. underwater photography. And I think also, like if you've been taking already since a long time pictures underwater, but you've never been going through a course, actually this is a very good segment to yep. follow and uh, make make sure that uh, you got all your uh, basics uh, polished uh, and uh, well. Started. Start, starting from the beginning and working your way up. Everybody could use a refresher as well of the basics. Yes, and we try to keep them short. Yep. Right? We try. We try. Depends how much entertainment we put into them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, without any further ado, is that For, very English? That is correct. Without further uh, ado, we go just. But ado is French. We straight. Uh, you should know that word. Sans uh, ajouter uh, des ch choses plus. Alex is uh, probably is watching right now and he's thinking like that guy cannot really <laughs> speak French. He's just Don't French. Don't put me on the spot, man. Je peux Come parler on. français. Your French is supposed to be good. All right, guys. Without any further ado, let's jump straight into the interview with uh, Alex and Mark. And uh, here we go. Here we go. We'll, uh, we'll be... Uh... Hello, Mark. Hello, Alex. Uh, how are you guys? Hi. Good. Good, good. Okay, so... Hey, guys. Luca. How are you, Mark? So we got Mark uh, in... Uh, are you in Ahmed, Mark? Yeah, sitting here in Ahmed, so uh, hopefully the internet connection will, uh, will be uh, uh, considerate and be supportive, uh, and I won't be cutting out on you guys. Uh. And where are you, Alex? Well, I'm in Sanur, so a bit more southern than Ahmed. Uh, connection is a bit better, but not 100% guaranteed as well, as well. So okay. let's see. So we are all here in Bali. Great, great things. Guys, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. And uh, we were uh, really, really uh, interesting. And uh, once uh, we hear about the project that you both are working on, so definitely we want to touch base the on that uh, but before we do so let's start uh, with mark mark why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience uh, what is that you do here in bali tell us okay uh I, thanks to uh thanks also for the opportunity um it's nice to come on and have a chat with you guys uh i'm um, my name is mark mark crane i'm based here in uh, ahmed uh, on the east coast of bali i am a uh, technical rebreather diver uh, instructor I've uh, been based in Bali about the last five, five six years, uh, where I concentrate on teaching um, rebreather diving techniques, advanced mixed gas to uh, 100 meters, not only here in Indonesia, but also throughout the uh, entire Southeast Asia region. Uh, so, you know, active uh, throughout this part of Asia, uh, really doing like, enjoy the diving. And when I'm not doing that, I am uh, very happy to volunteer and be involved with this deep reef research project, which I uh, do with my colleague here, Alexi. All right, cool. So tell us a little bit, Alexi, Alex, uh, about this uh, project that uh, you're running here in uh, in Bali, right? Yes, right. So, um, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm a French marine biologist um, based here in Indonesia for the last uh, six years, um, in Bali for the last four years. I've, before that, I spent two years in Jakarta uh, working for a consulting uh, company. And uh, this project, uh, well, is uh, aiming at documenting for the first time the, what we call the mesophotic coral ecosystems here in, uh, in Bali, and uh, to focus also on uh, 
very interesting fish behavior that we have down there, uh, particularly regarding the giant, the bumphead sunfish, sorry, uh, Mola Alexandrini. So I think you had uh, the Mola expert a few years ago on your... Uh, yeah, Marianne. Demo, she, she was yes, on exactly. our podcast. Yeah, right. exactly. So, so she's also involved on this project. Okay, so uh, in uh, you, you use a term before, like a scientific term about you studying about the, mm -hmm. the meso, say it again? Mesophotic, oh. Mesophotical ecosystem. Okay, so what is that? This is, to make it simple, uh, the, the current definition still in the big debate right now in the scientific uh, world, uh, it's basically the, the coral, coral ecosystem that you will find between 30, 40 meters down to 150 meters. That's the official uh, definition so far. Uh, it's undergoing a lot of uh, discussion because not everyone agrees that it should be based on depth. I mean, mesophotic is actually based on the light, right? Mesophotic mid, means mm -hmm. middle light. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, basically that's a ecosystem that is located, core reef ecosystem uh, that you can find in tropical and subtropical countries between 30 to 150 or sometimes a little bit over 150 uh, meters. Okay. Sounds very, very interesting. But tell us something uh... Uh, before that, so before coming to Bali and start this uh, research, uh, uh, what were you working on or what were you doing before? So uh, I was uh, actually, I came to Indonesia six years ago to work for a French consulting company uh, uh, focusing on the marine environment, marine and coastal environment. So I spent four years working for them, um, trying to develop and set up some projects. Uh, so as a consulting company, you have the it's a very diff diversified work. I mean, you, you can work on mangrove, you can work on deep oceans. I was not only working in Indonesia, I did some uh, field work in Middle East or in uh, South America as well. Um, so it was um, very broad, a lot of different missions, a lot of different tasks. Uh, and I spent like that four years of, uh, of my life in Indonesia were uh, dedicated to that. And, and then the last, yeah. Yeah, and then exactly. So, w what was the thing that uh, I think you were getting into that? Sorry to have interrupted you. So, but what was that? Uh, that uh, how did you get into this project? So, well, it, it's a combination of different things. I mean, I started diving back in 2010 in, in the Atlantic coast in, in France, so not at all in the tropical environment. And then when I moved to Indonesia, I, I continued my diving. I was a scientific diver. I, I did some diving, as I said, in the Middle East uh, on, on some uh, shallow uh, coral reefs. And when I was diving in Indonesia, when I was uh, reaching 30 meters, which is the limit of recreational diving uh, in the, at the SSI world, uh, we, I was always intrigued by what was deeper because I saw often, especially when you dive big walls in, uh, in Bunaken or you see big, big animals down there, big gorgonians, big sharks, big trevalis. So I was always wondering what's, what's deeper than that, actually. And I was also following uh, since, I mean, high school, I was following, you mentioned earlier about uh, Laurent Ballesta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was following him and his team um, since, I mean, high school. And I was, yeah, always fascinated by the photos he was bringing back, by the equipment he was using, those machines that makes no bubbles and you can dive deeper and so on so um yeah i, I stopped but it was very pricey to get into this world mm -hmm. and it took me time to get uh to the point where i could afford that training and then when i was in indonesia i i, I was thinking well that might be the good moment for me to to start uh, exploring the deeper part of the wall of the of, of the reef and that that's why i, I googled basically i think that was even actually through my it might be through steve linfield mark I, I don't really remember exactly how we we get in touch but i i contacted mark uh because i knew he was a ccr ccr uh, instructor here in bali and uh we met and he did my first uh trial on the on ap and i don't know if we can name uh, we really friends, but well, um I, I did my uh my first trial uh, on those machines and uh, yeah one thing le le leading to another then i i got the full uh, okay. training with mark 
Mark, hey, go ahead. we have a little bit of an attack in here. <laughs> Are you okay? Good. <laughs> right, cool. Hey, swallowing, God, give me, swallowing shit. Give me a protection. <laughs> I am exposed. <laughs> All right. So thanks, uh, Alex. Very, very interesting. And great to know, you know, like uh, um, uh, actually, for instance, inspired also by the, the great work of uh, Loran Balesta that uh, was uh, involved into deep research. And then you, need, need, you needed to find the person that actually can take you down that deep. Because as you said, you were yeah. just a recreational diver. So Mark, you got involved into this and uh, Ale Al Alexis uh, contacted you. And uh, basically Alexis is at this stage a recreational diver. What did you advise him to do uh, to start uh, pursue his, uh, his, uh, his work? Well, I mean, uh, for, first of all, if you, uh, yes, uh, Alexi got in contact with me. Um, I'd already actually spoken to somebody who was dealing with a similar kind of project material. I think you guys might also know Steve Linfield, uh, the Australian guy. Yeah. Uh, he was based in Yagidaza doing uh, his PhD, uh, PhD work mm -hmm. uh, on a similar kind of, uh, of topic. Uh, at that time, I was actually working for a company who were based down in Chandidasa. Uh, but then Steve got a really... Um, I had to go back, finish up his PhD and got a really dreamy job in Palau, uh, which we were all pretty jealous about. Yeah. It's quite <laughs> funny how the whole thing links back together because uh, with some of the uh, project findings that we then got, uh, Alexi contacted Steve and had some things confirmed and it was all like, oh yeah, I've got to come back, we've got to go, we've got to go diving. Steve's also a rebreather diver. Uh, and so through that connection, uh, I got to, uh, got to meet Alexi. He came with me specifically with the uh, question about getting trained on rebreathers because he could see the value that they have as a tool for this kind of research work. Yes. Um, because of what actually was then happening uh, with his employer at the time, uh, being French NGO, uh, so uh, working in Europe, uh, you have to actually uh, conform to European laws. Uh, so there was an overriding interest uh, for, for using one particular type of uh, rebreathing machine, one particular CCR. Uh, and I actually remember we would have been, the first place we met Alexi, I think, was Safety Stock up in Tulamban. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One, one yeah. evening, it's uh, an in tank, uh, and it was like, okay, we'll talk about these wonderful steam machines. Uh, and uh, my suggestion was uh, basically because of his scientific because of his uh, research diving background, best idea actually would come and do a, a rebreather trial, uh, uh, which is something I would actually recommend to anybody who's thinking about getting into rebreathers. Uh, give it a try. So it's a little bit of a try before you buy, uh, because you can get a bit of an idea of uh, what the machines are like, if it's even something for you. Uh, and each uh, each individual uh, rebreather, CCR, CCR specifically, it's very different from open circuit uh, because with uh, open circuit, you know, you can have regulated from one manufacturer and a regulated from the other manufacturer. The only difference nowadays is really basically color and size. Whereas mm. with rebreathers, everyone is is a little bit different. They have their own little nuances, their own little characters, which you need to get to know. You need to know uh, which tool you'll be able to work with, uh, which tool you'll be comfortable with. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. the question, is there anything like a perfect rebreather? Uh, if you can show me a perfect rebreather, I'll show you Moses and the burning bush. <laughs> uh, so uh, th th there's things here that you, you, you do have to accept. There are positives and negatives. I have a question for you. So I, you, maybe, I, I don't know, like if people normally approach you that they already have, let's say, a, a goal like uh, Alexis did or like, Maybe people just say like, oh, I want to learn rebreather for fun and, and, and go deep. So here we have um, Alexis coming to you and he has a specific goal. He wants to do some scientific work uh, underwater and then learning a new machine and a new way of diving and keep control on those uh, of those aspects while you are, let's say, at the 100 meter deep. That is uh, probably is one of his goal to was one of his goal to to do and what was what was your uh, thought like what sort of training did you envision for him I, i'd like to know how long did you think that it would take 
and uh, where were you specifically thinking uh, of uh, dedicating more particular attention to during his training? Uh, for, for sure, I mean, uh, when, when the question here arose, I want to use it then for scientific, um, it, it sparked my interest because, uh, I mean, uh, Indonesia, uh, I've been in Indonesia now for about eight years in total. Uh, in various parts of it. It's a fantastic country, uh, great people, uh, fantastic diving. Uh, and it was like, right, yeah, okay, um, I'd like to support in this one. But uh, what I also actually think uh, made very clear in the beginning was it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of money. Uh, uh, I mean, just shooting off uh, with closed circuit free breathing equipment down to 100 meters is not something you do, uh, you know, in a week, in a week or you know, in three months. Uh, uh, that's what we call fast and furious. And that's the way unfortunately accidents happen. So it was like, okay, let's just take it easy. Uh, let's let's try some rebreathers. Uh, normally uh, the rebreather try that, uh, that I offer um, is, is a two dive program. Uh, it gets done in a, uh, in a full day. Uh, and I said to Alexei, hey, listen, why don't you take two or three days? So we actually spend a little bit more time, a little more, more time in the water. Uh, do some more diving on the units, and then you can take it from there. That kind of got him hooked, uh, which is, you know, from a business perspective, fantastic because it was a good time. Uh, <laughs> so then that's your technique, how you reel them in. Try it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you always get a free trial. Sorry, I, I, I want to hear from Alex. How was your first experience on a rebreather with Mar? Uh, well, it was great, but. Um, that's that was that's very important what mark said that these trials are really necessary because as as far as i'm concerned i was ready to go for another completely different unit than the one i'm using right now and because of the trial i i was able to compare the two units and realize that the one i was initially targeting was not the one that i would actually uh, need for the for the work i mean I could have done the work with the, the, the other unit, but it was more comfortable and more, uh, there was more redundancy in the unit I, I ended up choosing. So yeah, that was, that was great for that because that was really an eye opener. And, uh, and it also showed me how difficult it will be because when you are already used to open circuit diving, you have basically to learn everything from scratch again because you don't have the, the same way of diving a rebreather than you have uh, for diving open circuit. So, that was that was great. As Mark said, it's it's uh, you can easily see whether rebreather diving is for you or not if uh, you do some trial instead of rushing into buying all this fancy equipment and realize later that actually you don't want to dive that. Yes. So that was a very good thing. When, when uh, Alex and I'll be back to you in a moment, Mark. But Alex, when you do your work uh, down there, so to um, identify. Uh, the marine life, the coral life uh, at depth. Uh, how do you do that? Well, uh, basically, I mean, first, I just want to highlight the fact that I was not only interested in rebreather for uh, necessarily going deep. Uh, that was also for the duration of the dive, because in one rebreather dive, you can spend so long. If you are at 30 meters, uh, you can maybe spend hours uh, without having to go back to the surface when you are doing some open circuit diving you have to go up and down and I always found that it was very tiring when I work on scientific project and you have to even in shallow waters you have to go up change your tank get back in and that's really exhausting even if you're not working deep and with rebreather you can extend this lifetime so yeah. that that's really great and for the identification uh, perspective that's uh, well I'm not a tax <coughs> sorry <coughs> I'm not a taxonomist so uh, uh, most of the ID that I'm doing whether I'm doing open circuit or rebreather diving is basically the same I, I either we know already what species we are looking for and we can ID them quite easily uh, or we are um, taking photos videos and we try to ID that uh, later on uh, on the desk uh, okay uh, on the computer. so that means it requires you to take down uh, a camera okay what camera do you use for this uh, work for this project i'm using a nikon uh, dslr full frame camera uh, d750 uh, to be <clears throat> to be precise okay uh, that's uh, yeah 
and what's the is, camera that I, yeah what is a good housing to use at that depth let's say of 100 meters well you have to be very careful with the housing but also with the dome you are using for right. your for your lens because if your housing is rated for 200 but your dome is rated for 60, 60. then you might have a slight issue when you hit the 100 uh okay. bottom uh, have you so have you had an issue top. with yeah. the dome port is Did that from that? experience yeah. I didn't have an issue with the blowing dome port, but I had the tiny issue that I still didn't recover fully until now, a leak uh, from, uh, from the vacuum valve that, uh, that was fully my mistake on this one. I forget to put the cap on and I realized when uh, I reached 100 meters that I heard the alarm beeping and I was like, no way. Yeah, and no I way to go up. It <laughs> was the water. Yeah, but when you are 100 meters, you cannot just go back yeah, and no. straight. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, no chance. Only the compression. <laughs> so what? So, the, and I'll the water see. is getting in very fast. So no, the but that's that has nothing to do with the housing. That was purely a human mistake. Yeah. Uh, the housing actually I'm using now. I started with a Noticam housing, um, but now I switched to a Seacam. Seacam is uh, supporting us on on this project. Okay. And they are just amazing housing for that. Yes. So yeah, did you yeah. did, did you see some uh, uh, so oh, we're talking about now some serious depth some serious pressure did you see some uh, uh, obvious differences between let's say a Nauticam and a Seacam to this sort of work Oh yeah Yeah well I, I don't want to I mean Nauticam is working flawlessly uh, at all the depths we've been uh, I think on the project the deepest one was 125 or something like that and never never have any issues uh, with Noticam. You have to add the you need to have a special uh, special housing that special upgrade uh, if you wish because the buttons start to work very difficult. The, it's becoming very difficult to uh, press the buttons when you reach depths deeper than eighty meters. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's harder to to, to control the, the camera. Okay. So yeah, so I have some some issue with that, but once again, that depend. It, it just needs to have the proper housing that is uh, properly rated for the right depth. Okay. So you <clears throat> get trained to go now to 100 meters. Mark, I'm coming back to you, and he's bringing also a big camera because uh, so the kind of equipment that you just described. We're talking about something like about just the housing, maybe like this, and with the strobes because you need the illumination system. We're talking about big things to carry underwater. And I think that also takes lots of your focus and attention when you are there taking uh, photos and so on. So what was your approach, Mark, uh, when you knew that uh, he wants to do a rebreather and he also needs to take uh, this big camera underwater in, in the training? What did you think? Uh... I think actually uh, what, what, what you need to remember here, Luca, uh, is that it, it, it all kind of came about through that. Uh, I mean, and Alexi's uh, initial uh, request and interest was definitely seeing rebreathers now as a tool, uh, also going into this kind of deep reef work. But at that time, he actually wasn't really uh, looking at, the, at, the, at this 100 meter level. At that time, he wasn't actually really uh, using a very big uh, semi-professional underwater uh, uh, photography rig. Uh, it was actually then getting him started uh, on uh, on the rebreather training, where we then first of all started focusing on the first level, which is 40 meters with uh, with a little bit of deco, then moving up to the 60 meters and then going uh, deeper on. So this project has kind of been in development here for probably a, a good three and a half years, uh, with, with, with Alexi actually putting quite a lot of his own uh, personal time uh, and finances into getting to this level. Uh, he's a poor scientist. <laughs> uh, and while we're going out and doing these kind of uh, training dives, because it's not only a case of, uh, of just doing the course, you then need to actually go out and carry on gaining experience and like almost fun diving. Uh, we were actually having some fantastic interactions uh, with, with, you know, with, with, with large marine life. We were seeing freshy sharks. We were having uh, a good occurrence of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of sunfish. Uh, and Alexi goes like, "We really need to actually come up with this project, but it's getting a little bit expensive." Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, uh, you know, there was a camera coming in, and there was a camera housing, and it was like a dome port. You guys know what all this means. Yeah, we know a little bit about it. Every breather side of things cost, and it's just, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a money pair. Um, so, <laughs> actually, then started developing there. Uh, and we've been very, very lucky um, yeah. through uh, contact within the, uh, the industry, within the community, also with, uh, with Alexi's credentials and his hard work. Uh, we've had uh, great support from uh, like Jim Standing of Fourth Element, uh, from Bruce and Lynn Partridge in Shearwater, even the Canadians, the Canucks have plugged their mic. Uh, uh, fantastic products as well. They've been uh, really, really good to us. Uh, so that we were actually able to do this, uh, to, 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 to get the equipment, to get the materials, to get the gas and the logis logistics to actually go down and research this stuff. Cool. That's a whole team, team effort, a, lo a lot of fundraising and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is a little bit of a team effort. I mean, obviously, these kind of things, they, uh, they do then get to, to, to be quite, uh, quite costly. Even when you're using an efficient tool like a rebreather, but you're still having to have uh, outlay for, for for boats, for gas, for absorbent. Then there's you know wear and tear, mm -hmm. uh, the, the spares. So uh, I mean, uh, a primary a primary role for me is with, with the project is setting up logistics, uh, making sure gear is serviced. That's what I'm actually uh, catching up with now. I'm servicing my gear, uh, my units. I'm servicing uh, Alexi's units. Uh, unit. Thank you for that. Uh, looking after cylinders, getting all that sorted out. Uh, so when we're allowed to go diving again, we'll uh, we'll be we'll be ready to do it. Uh, in the water, I kind of do very very limited uh, videography on a GoPro. Yep. Mm -hmm. so that's about as, as my uh, underwater photography videography skills go. Just like point and press. Uh, <laughs> uh, as then just keeping a general eye on uh, uh, on, on team safety. Uh, so, it's so you are the safety asset. diver, okay? And that's uh, also where I was a little bit heading towards is is this because uh, so Alexis, you you busy down there? You're doing some work and you mm -hmm. have a camera, and uh, definitely you also need to have somebody that just fully focus about the dive. And is that what you, Mark does? Seems like. Yeah, basically that's uh, very important for me actually to be able to dive with uh, someone like Mark who uh, is, uh, well, besides his diving skills that uh, we don't need to debate about but uh, anymore, but uh, he also doesn't have necessarily the, the scientific approach, which is he can keep his head focused on, on the diving because um, well, you know, you also are a videographer and photographer, and it doesn't matter if you are pro or amateur, uh, when you have a camera in your hand, you tend to for forget about uh, your, your, um, your diving, your computer, your, your, your gas and stuff like that. And when, obviously, when you are doing some deeper stuff, it's more critical to control those parameters that just keep you alive. And, um, well... Obviously, I, I'm doing that as much as I can. Yeah, and, uh, but sometimes, it's just when when you are focused on something, then you might forget to uh, to check your PO2 and your PO2 might drop a little bit, or you don't. Most most importantly, that's the time because I don't really see the time when I take yes. photos. But you know that when we plan those deep dives, we have a very specific uh, bottom time that we need to uh, to follow if we want to keep ourselves safe. And this is that that sometimes. Often, Mark, yes, I know, I tend to, uh, to forget and having Mark <laughs> reminding me, hey, it's time to go up now. Yeah. It's always good. But if we were like two people taking photos or two people uh, doing some scientific work, we might not see the time, both yeah. of us, and we might end You're up just blowing up our, time. our Yeah, exactly. So that was very important for the project Hello? to have uh, someone like Mark. That, 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 bring that, that has happened once, time, I believe, though, Alexis. <laughs> where, we, where we've lost track of the time yeah uh, that can be a little because we, we've got a we've got a, a a thing up now at the end of one of your videos is talking about what does it take max depth 125 meters first decompression stop mm -hmm. 60 meters total dive time of three hours and 19 minutes now we're talking a lot different than your recreational diver out here and you you've got to be pretty much yeah. exact when you're when you say okay we've done exactly 15 minutes 
if you say you screw that up and you're not paying attention, you do say 17 or 18 minutes at the bottom instead of 15, how much more would that put onto your decompression? At 125, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it really does depend. Uh, that kind of a debt, yeah, you probably, for every minute you're uh, staying down there, you're getting 10, 15 minutes extra decom. Right. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a. How it's many precise. contingency plans do you make uh, when you plan this uh, dive? <laughs> How many contingency plans do you make for this? Uh, you really actually uh, only make one. One. Uh, basically, which is if the uh, if the rebreather fails, right? Okay, because that's when you're going to need to actually have the gas to get out. Okay. Yep. And so this is, uh, this is a, 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 again something. Uh, I'll be quite honest. Uh, we we could have better protocols uh, and procedures in place, uh, but it is uh, again a little bit a question of logistics uh, of uh, support finance. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, be, for these kind of debts, it'd be great if we'd actually have a support line with us on every dive. Somebody would actually come down and meet us on those initial mm -hmm. uh, or medium range decompression stops, handing over cylinders, uh, uh, collecting uh, unnecessary cylinders that we don't need anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah. these things, this, doing this kind of project work, uh, especially your first project, I mean, this is like the, the first major project that uh, Alexi's doing uh, as an independent. Uh, you need to actually give the uh, scientific community um, some kind of evidence that we've done this before so they take you seriously. Yeah. If you haven't done that before, it's very, very difficult to get funding. So we've been doing this on uh, with the support we've had, which has been fantastic, which has been excellent. Uh, but we've still been doing it a little bit on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. And doing things on a shoestring, you then actually have to make compromises. It's unfortunate. So you carry the old thing. You know, coming up with solid uh, uh, in-team protocols and procedures, taking human factors into consideration, actually debating it and discussing it honestly uh, and openly prior and after every dive, getting everybody who is involved, which is like from the from the local uh, fisherman boat uh, boatman uh, all the way up to the people that sort of handle the back end stuff. Um, that's really really important. So it's uh, nice and transparent all the way through. Is this the way you can actually then learn and you can develop? We've actually come up with some uh, good protocols and procedures, uh, and touch wood, nothing's happened. Um, taking uh, the right amount of gas, I mean, it's always questionable. It always depends on what kind of emergency you're you're, you're planning with uh, or planning for. Uh, but obviously, you know, those kind of depths, when things go wrong, they go wrong quickly, quite badly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they go quite bad uh, quite quickly so uh, it's something that does uh, does play on our minds yeah absolutely and uh what well, no my, my question fish, going back a little bit towards fish here so you're you're the the vast majority of our viewers they're going to be you know 40 40 meters and shallower for the time that you guys are spending below um below 50 meters say between uh, let's go to 100 meters the time that you're spending at 100 meters what's the fish biomass like is it is there a lot more fish than people would think i mean obviously we we're up in the in the shallows a lot there's a lot of fish up shallow but once you get down there is it a, a big drop off on fish biomass or is it still fairly consistent yeah you you will see a big uh, big drop of uh, fish biomass and um yeah that's that's I think most of the Mesophotic Reef are, are like that around the world. You, you see usually a decline in uh, biodiversity and fish biomass. But once again, I think it's a case by case. Uh, you have some reefs that are particularly uh, abundant in, uh, in fish. Uh, but in, here in Ahmed, you can clearly see a big drop. Uh, the deeper you go, the less fish you will have. But you will have some species that you don't find in the, in the shallows. So, right. You have a kind of a switch in the in the species that you will find, uh, but clearly yes, less fish down there than than in the shallow reefs. Do you ever get surprised by something that you see down there, like you're down at ninety meters and all of a sudden here comes a turtle or something like that? Well, we we had I don't remember I think we had some uh, some turtle pretty deep, but. Uh, you, you see that, yes, yeah, some, some sharks that you usually see in the shallows uh, that we, we find now deeper on the reef, like the simple white tip uh, reef shark, they, they are uh, 
they can be found a little bit deeper uh, nowadays because of the pressure you have in the shallow coming from the tourist industry, from divers, the fishing, uh, from divers and the fishing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even traditional fishing. Uh, so you have some fish like like that. And while I don't, we had we had a lot of very nice encounters down there. We we had this. Remember, Mark, this uh, whale shark when we were ascending that? from a deep dive. That, that, uh, we that was an adventure. Yeah. I was around uh, like 50 something where we're ascending and we saw this big shadow and it just turn right above our head uh, and swim away from the reef back in the blue and gone. That was a, that was a nice one. Yeah. Yeah. Molas, we're looking yeah, at some of the photos here. See hammerheads. Yes. Yeah. So all these sharks that are uh, the freshers as well. I mean, they are fresher shark. They are usually deeper than the, the, like the traditional reef sharks, but um, yeah, we, we see them every year, not every dive far from that, unfortunately, but we see them every year. Um, and that's very, very nice uh, encounter every time. Magical one on a rebreather. They're not, they're not really scared. So right. They really come close to you and they are uh, quite, quite curious, uh, quite and curious animal. I'm uh, not sure if our audience can see this, but right now I have a picture here taken of a long nose hawkfish, which is mm -hmm. on a sea fan, a Gorgonian sea fan. Yeah. And it looks like it's got also plenty of uh, ladybugs uh, isopods on yeah. it. Like, do you see lots of these uh, little crustaceans uh, and uh, interesting marine so life? There, there, there are on the pictures you look on the picture you're looking at. There are exactly 113 um, ladybug amphipods on this one. <laughs> okay, well, I'm <laughs> impressed that you spent the time to look. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Uh, I had to, because actually I discovered that uh, on the photo later when I upload the photo on my computer, okay. I didn't see them at yeah. the time because I really like this photo because uh, it was dur during descent, so we don't have a lot of time during descent. We have just we, we tried to hit the bottom as yeah. fast as we can. So we were heading for a 100 meter dive. And Mark was in front of me and I stopped by on this sea fan to shoot this uh, long nose. I think I took only four photos of it just in less than a minute. And then I had to follow and catch up with Mark who was already deeper. And when I get back on the computer and I upload this photo and I saw like all these ladybugs and I was like, Oh, that's awesome. That's really nice. And yes. that's where actually I see that uh, I just discovered them at, at the time. Yeah. And this was taken at 82 meters, so pretty deep. So yeah. this long nose oak fish is usually deeper than 25, but uh, that's still a nice, uh, nice uh, encounter. You know, we you don't need to see big, big fish, you know, no, 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 no. tiny know, encounters already. We know that very well. I and mean, we're actually in uh, our audience uh, right now, there are uh, many of the people that they come diving with us uh, that they love ladybugs and now here mm -hmm. at minus 82 meters ladybugs opportunities guys let's go <laughs> all get in trade with mark uh, rebreather to see the ladybugs <laughs> great and also the sea pen looks like the the coloration of it it, it doesn't have uh, much on it it's like more on the white uh, white yeah. color side but I so that's what you will see mm. you right you have less colors uh, like because of yeah, less yes. sunlight or yeah exactly so that's the same way when you i mean in the coral world a lot of corals are uh, in the shallows i mean they are all uh, they all have like these tiny uh, micro algae that they are living in their in their tissue and that's what provide the coral the coral their, their colors but because the deeper you go the less sunlight you will have so photosynthesis is uh, not possible anymore so that's why you have some corals that are becoming completely white because now they are only relying on what we call heterotrophic um, uh, diet feeding. So they are just here to they catch food themselves. They don't rely on an algae that will do the photosynthesis and provide them with sugars and so on because there is so little light, the algae cannot survive. Right. Okay. So that's why you, the, the octocorals that you will find, usually they are white. <clears throat> I have a question for you. It's, uh... It's about uh, coral bleaching, for instance. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we have few times uh, here, uh, it happened uh, worldwide uh, that we have this uh, phenomena in which the temperature rises uh, and the corals start to bleach. And not only the corals, sometimes we see also like uh, sea anemone bleaching mm -hmm. and so on. So yeah. uh, 
is the first process of this bleaching is actually the algae uh, disappearing from them. Mm -hmm. So the, that... the, the fact why a coral is bleaching is because, uh, so a, a coral is made of many uh, coral polyps, so these tiny, well, it's like a jellyfish that you put upside down and that's, uh, that's what the polyp is and the, the algae is living within the polyp uh, flesh. And when the temperature are rising, uh, the, the algae becomes toxic, if you want to put it that way, for the, for the coral. So the coral expel the algae until the conditions are back to, to normal. And then they will reintegrate the algae uh, 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 later on. But if the, uh, if the heat wave is too long, the coral will uh, die in the end because you will not be able to get the algae uh, fast back fast enough in its, uh, in, its tissue, in its tissue. And since coral reef, I mean, many coral are, are relying on algae up to 80%. I mean, 80% of the diet are coming from the algae, sometimes even more. So you imagine that basically they starve to death. Okay, so the, the, that's the, why I wanted to ask you because I just learned something new. It seems like uh, that so a, uh, a change in temperature expels the algae, so the coral is not able mm -hmm. to feed anymore. Yeah. But you're saying that yes. down in the deep, the coral kind of learn a new way to feed itself, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah, so this not really learning, I mean, depends, but Evolved you have some it. different coral species down there. So you have some species that are adapted to low light environments, so they are able uh, physiologically to uh, eat, find the, 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 their food from uh, active feeding, not from uh, photosynthetic. Okay. But if you are going that way, it's, it, it won't necessarily be possible to put those, those corals back in the shallows because the algae also act as a layer of protection towards uh, um, sunlight because, you know, like with the UV and uh, that can be uh, quite harmful for any living things. So the algae also act as a layer of protection. So if you put some coral that are not used, that are not working with algae, if you put them in the shallows, they will not, they will not survive. They will not, not survive. Adapted to them. Yeah. Okay. Not so necessarily, I mean. Well, this is... Uh, there are always exceptions. This is very interesting. And actually, my question came also because uh, we noticed uh, in certain areas, and one of them being the wreck. You remember that we went through, Mark, uh, a, a bleaching uh, a few years ago, and we started to have like a bit of white patch. But we also noticed that uh, uh, many of those corals uh, recovered quite quickly so probably now you answer my my question is basically they expel these algae but uh, the temperature eventually stabilized quick enough for the algae uh, to, to to get those algae back on them right yeah exactly yeah so it's a, it's a mix of temperature but you also have direct sunlight so if for example you have a coal that is directly exposed to uh, to sun uh, even the temperature is back to normal, that, that might be also difficult for it to recover because of the direct uh, sun, sunlight that is hitting the coral. And you will see sometimes, I, I saw that in Indonesia, sometimes you have coral that are half covered, so half under the shade most of the day, and the, the protected side of the coral will not bleach, but the one that is under direct sun exposure will be completely bleached. So um, I think there is also this uh, factor that, Beside the temperature itself, there is also the direct sunlight exposure that can make things worse. Interesting. All right. And uh, so what's your next step, uh, Alexis, in your project now? Let's say once we are out from this uh, crisis uh, of uh, COVID-19. Yes. Well, that's a bit of a shame that uh, well, this uh, pandemic here is uh, hitting uh, all the world quite, quite hard. Uh, actually, so the first part of the project was achieved, so it was on a National Geographic Society grant, and um, I also had a grant from the French Embassy that is funding some research project in Indonesia, so uh, this, that was for 2019, and for 2020, the Ministry of Higher Education and Research of Indonesia granted me another year of research here, um, and this year was supposed to be focusing on another area uh, in Nusa Penida to be precise, and uh, other dive, dive areas around the, the Karangasem Regency. Um, 
and the the objective this time will be more to evaluate whether or not uh, those deep cleaning stations provide the same kind of quality in terms of cleaning than the shallower ones. So we would like to investigate that and investigate also the impact uh, of heavy diving uh, in uh, on those shallow cleaning stations for the sunfish as well, because that that has not been uh, evaluated. And we don't really know uh, how resilient the, those sunfish are when they are confronted to those uh, high level of stress when you have 10, 20 divers coming and just surrounding you when you are quietly cleaning. That might be a quite stressful event. And there was a video, I think, uh, last year uh, of a sunfish just bumping into the divers I trying to escape. I saw it the day before yesterday yeah. that the, yeah. the Ocean Sunfish Research Instagram account posted recently oh, yes. so yes. everyone can go there and see it where there is this yeah. sunfish surrounded by divers and he doesn't know where mm -hmm. to go and then he kind of panicked and went straight again against one of the divers so definitely yeah. this is something that uh, we uh, for instance at the underwater tribe uh, we're very glad to hear that uh, uh, you have this interest to actually further uh, research into this uh, because uh, mm -hmm. definitely we recognize that uh, there is a problem, especially, let's say, in, uh, in sites like uh, Crystal Bay. But let's say not only sunfish, also like a manta, you know, like mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. in uh, Manta Point, uh, <clears throat> the amount of divers uh, and uh, now the amount of snorkelers that are actually on mm -hmm. top of uh, the cleaning station. I noticed that uh, more recently in uh, 2018, uh, uh, in two, sorry, in 2019, quite a bit, I noticed that the amount of snorkelers really uh, increased and the mm. rules that they were following were not as, uh, let's say, strict as the divers that they stay around the cleaning station, so the manta has the, the clear uh, top, but they were actually on top of the cleaning station, duck diving down, and I have even some footage about that uh, on record. And you yeah. can see that the mantas were changing their behavior. So yeah, yeah. you will discover some deep water cleaning station with your work already in uh, Karangasam. Were you doing that in the Ahmed Tulamed? Well, it's not, <clears throat> it's not really a discovery. I mean, uh, Mark has been seeing them uh, for, for a while and all the divers as well, but it was more of uh, trying to document them officially and uh, try to publish something in the, in the scientific community so everyone is aware of that and how to move forward to have more research done on that topic and to improve the conservation of that aspect because the thing is we don't know much about those deep cleaning station uh, we don't know if they are really localized in one precise station that it, like it can be for shallow reefs like you have this like little uh, rats that are living on this coral and all the fish are coming here to knowing where the station is uh, or if they are more like areas where the, the sunfish can be cleaned and that's what we try to understand because it's it's very important for a conservation perspective to know uh, how to protect how to conserve things you need to basically know what you are talking about and documenting that was really a first step i mean i'm not i don't claim to be high level or to do high level of research or high level of conservation or high level of uh, photography but i think that uh by doing this little work, little project, we can start building something and start uh, having a bigger picture on yes. how to better conserve our our reef and yes. raise awareness about yeah. those uh, about those reefs. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and on those busy sites, uh, it's quite important yes. that we start to get uh, some more regulation mm -hmm. in place, uh, limiting maybe the impact given by the yes. by the divers on those reefs. Okay, and for anyone that didn't see that Mola Mola video, I actually suggested to go on the Ocean Sun Fish Research Instagram page and have a look at it for yourself about what we are talking about. And also, we, we're posting all uh, your guys, your, uh, your Instagram and everything in the description so our audience can actually go and see your work and uh, what you're doing. What about you, Mark? So now. We are all uh, in uh, lockdown with COVID-19. Uh, what's the plan? You doing servicing and? 
servicing. Uh, I'm having a little bit of fun learning to uh, fly the drone. Uh, missing the diving. Uh, I'm having complete withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> I've got a very, very low blood PO2 level currently, which is something that is shocking. Um, so, yeah. Um, but I'm also actually uh, doing some um, review for teaching materials, coming up actually with um, a new training program. Uh, also doing so, uh, some editing on a training workshop that, uh, that I want to actually be offering when, when we're all out of this. Uh, and cooking, getting fat. Ah. Yes, that we're all doing. <laughs> Mike, you put a no thinking, thinking about moving into distilling gin. Distilling that gin. would be even better. Don't say that online, you might get in trouble. And uh, <laughs> Mark. For sure, and I promise you this. Once, <laughs> once we are out of this, we're coming up for that discovery rebreather dive. So Absolutely, we've been talking this uh, for a while, guys. <laughs> Be careful, that's a slippery yeah. slope. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about this for a while, actually. You know, Alexis, that uh, of course uh, we make a film underwater and uh, have. Mm. the chance of being without bubbles uh, to do not disturb the, the marine life down there is yeah. uh, something that we really would like to 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 explore and pursue and uh, mm. that's a great target yeah. so so mark you might will have to split yourself a little bit to working with uh, alexis uh, conservation and then filming with us because we are also gonna have like uh, we need a a guardian angel down there because we're going to be fully on, on the cameras and things. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure we'll do that. <laughs> so one last thing that uh, I would like to, to briefly touch bases here. So I, we were talking about this, Alexis, uh, about, uh, let's say, pollution and things. So we know that uh, plastic, uh, uh, single-use plastic uh, is a big reality, uh, especially uh, in places... Uh, uh, where they don't have uh, uh, recycling facilities and all infrastructure in place uh, to dispose of, of them. Uh, and um, unfortunately, it's a reality that we have, let's say, here in Indonesia, that we see plastic on the shores and so on. And we can see also floating on the, in the sea. How is it down there at depth? Tell me a little bit, uh, Alexis, what, where your discovery is. Well, you still have, unfortunately, you still have some uh, plastic pollution down there. Uh, it's less abundant than in the shallow reefs, but you still have like uh, plastic bags, um, the, the rice bags, you know, like they are using those white rice bags, uh, which are shedding and yeah. that's a terrible thing at and getting entangled in the gorgonians and corals. Um, well, we had also plastic bottle uh, that we yeah, I photographed I'm, I'm the showing first actually time in one February. Here. So the one from right. your Instagram was uh, taken how long ago? Sorry, February, you said. Uh, so the first photo I took of this bottle was in February, and I took the same bottle uh, in October, I think. Okay, so, so the one on Instagram uh, is from February, and then October mm. is eight months later. And still, yeah, seven uh, to eight months later. Mm. Still. And that's, uh, that's the thing also about those deep reefs, they are, because there is less light going there, the, the, the temperature is colder, you have potentially less uh, swells and waves, of course, so the plastic will break down very, very slowly, uh, which will take longer to disappear uh, than in the shallow reefs. But you also have a lot of uh, plastic pollution actually coming, most of the plastic pollution is actually coming from the lost fishing gears. So... Uh, long lines. Uh, we have a lot of fishermen using long lines for tuna fish fisheries, um, and you have nets. Obviously, some nets uh, get lost, and then they they drown and they get entangled in everything down there. So it's um, yeah, it's a reality. Uh, it's not because it's far uh, that we don't see them that they are not impacted by uh, by our our way of life. So yeah, that's a sad sight actually when you are diving down there and you expect no one to have come here and you realize that you still have some plastic things that's uh, yeah very but sad it's a reality and, that uh, we need to address uh, uh, on a side note there um we uh, we did a little bit of a uh, exploration uh, expedition a couple of years ago in uh, southeastern sulawesi 
uh, where we're uh, having a look at uh, also some uh, different uh, marine environments, but uh, had the opportunity of diving some virgin caves, uh, which nobody's actually ever been in before. Um, we actually had a, a, a friend of ours, uh, Ed, join us on the, that particular expedition, uh, who's also a full cave diver. And um, we were back end of this uh, uh, initial part of this cave system where for sure nobody has ever dived in before. Uh, and we knew we were in the uh, freshwater aquifer of the, uh, the island uh, because we just had the... Um, uh, there was there's a there was a label of a uh, Nestle uh, aqua bottle uh, just sort of like you know lying down in in the sand uh, well in the silt so it was really like a case of like wow uh, where is this actually traveled how is this traveled here uh, mm. and uh, our, our, our plastic waste gets everywhere on the planet you now yeah. just because we we can't see we don't know where it go, goes to exactly and no human has been in this environment and we're we're already finding uh, um, evidence of the human trash yeah yeah and then uh, as you said you know like uh, the the thing is this like if we don't see it we don't think about it right and then when mm -hmm. we see we go like oh my god there is something there but it's a reality out there and uh, it needs to be definitely addressed uh, more yeah one of the reality that needs to be addressed more the pollution part but also the losses of species you know, and then I think that mm -hmm. uh, as uh, we don't have that much uh, research down there, like uh, you're, you're doing now, so that there, there is not as many people uh, dedicating time into that. It comes very interesting what you were saying before that at depth we even have, let's say, sort of uh, less species maybe than what we find up in the shallower. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what yeah. we are losing down there. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. And that's also why, I mean, uh, the 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 image are really, I think, a powerful tool to, to raise awareness more than a scientific paper. Because, well, when it's important to get science done and to publish some scientific paper, because this is how also you make, uh, you, you kind of coin the knowledge and you make sure that this knowledge will be available as a basic for, as a basis for future studies. It, it's never reaching the general public, you know, and that's a general public that will be able to vote for the leaders that will take care of the ocean of the, of the nature on land and if you don't bring this knowledge to the general public then they will never know and you can't blame them i mean it's very hard to protect something that you don't know that you never heard about and if you think there is no more life deeper than 40 meters why you should be worried if suddenly they are telling you that they are trolling um, giant nets uh, at those depths so if people uh, start to understand that life is basically everywhere uh, they would start caring more and uh, yeah i think that's why images are so important whether they are videos or photos they can speak more than long uh, long text or long discussion so yeah well guys i think uh, i think this is a yeah. great way to actually lead out i mean it was really nice to to talk with you both uh, and you gave some great insights and some very interesting project that you both are working on quite difficult to access to it but uh, if maybe like uh, any one of our audience that are listening to this segment like that are into conservation like that is there a way maybe they can we will place the link of your website and they can maybe support mm -hmm. you into this project uh, and uh, sure. making it uh, continue for sure and in the meantime make sure that uh, because uh, this crisis and things that, that you can extend uh, the or the permits that you already had available yes. for this time that you're not able to use so that you yeah, can continue yeah. into this project i'm sure you will be able to because mm. uh, it's very yeah. very interesting and uh, i like the idea of the continuation to go analyzing those deep water cleaning station are they viable alternative or not uh, uh, to the shallow water and so on. we need more study on that great guys thanks a lot for joining us on this uh, and it was great talking to you and uh, we look for the, the progress from both of you and to hear more in the future as a follow-up for sure. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having us. Bye, guys. Uh, very appreciated. Uh, you guys stay safe and take it easy. Will yes. do. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. And thanks, and Mark, we're, and we're going to touch. We're, we're
go and rebreathe the diving when, when we get out of this. Yes. <laughs> I was more interested in the gin. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be by there. <laughs> All right. I can as well, Mike. There you go. <laughs> okay, guys. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Great chatting Bye-bye. to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So that was an amazing interview, wasn't it, Mike? It sure makes you kind of think, oh, do I want to go down to 120 meters or do I not want to go down to 120 meters? I definitely want to go down to 120 meters For with sure. Mark, fully kitted with a rebreather, fully kitted with my camera. Well, you need somebody like Mark to actually yeah. be paying attention to you because I know you won't be paying attention to your things. You'll yeah. be paying attention to your camera. Yeah, exactly. And I touched yes. a frogfish because I said exactly. Yes. That's quite a routine now because I said lots of exactly. But uh, in, the, in the questions actually coming up on Facebook, uh, we had some very interesting questions. One of those was like, uh, where, where can I start to stop worrying about my rebreather, what depth uh, and, and so on. A rebreather, it's quite a complex machine. Sure so you, you need to uh, supervise that. And as Al Ale Alex was saying also, is uh, basically he can concentrate on his uh, um, scientific project because mark is not on the scientific project uh, let's say with this mindset but right. his, his mindset is being there as a safety diver and make sure that when it's time to go up, they start to go up. incredible like yep. conservation adapt and i really loved when uh, uh, alexis said uh, like uh, you know basically life is everywhere yes and no matter what depth you are you you got life down there so even if we don't see it we need to protect it and uh, take care of it uh, Hundred percent. I've got I've got a friend. He's a fish researcher, Brian Green. I don't know if you're watching this, but he quoted to me one time at, at one point that something like for every I can't remember if it's every thirty minutes they spend underwater uh, below a hundred meters, they find something like fifteen new species of fish. It's yes, the amount of different species that are down below that hundred meter mark compared mm -hmm. to what we know up here, it's just uh, amazing. Yeah. They they find new ones all the time and very very quickly. Because it's just, there's not a lot of people going down there. So the, the, the unknown species count is quite big. That's quite an interesting field. And also Dr. Mark Edman uh, that uh, also is still shooting and finding yep. new species for uh, that beautiful uh, set of uh, three books the with all the right. ID that we have here available. And he was saying that uh, most of them, the most recent findings are just below 60. Yep. Yeah. Away from where all of us are. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much uh, to Alex and uh, Mark. You made it uh, really like a great show and it was uh, very, very interesting and full of insights. And uh, we definitely um, we definitely look forward to see some updates uh, from your project as soon as uh, we are out of this uh, I'd like to see if people annoying situation. comment there in the comments about how many people are now interested in actually going and exploring this and, yeah. and doing some research or doing some uh, rebreather diving down there. Yeah. And Mark has been around the block here in yep. Indonesia now for a while. So definitely is uh, the guy to go to when you want to do your technical diving. He's here. up in Ahmed. So easy to find. We've got the, we've got the, the link to his dive center down there in the comments. Yes. So as well as Alex uh, links are also in the comment. If you are interested into the conservation project, you can refer to those uh, uh, links down there. Yep. All right. So, Great show, and uh, we're going to have a weekend ahead of us. Uh, we are coming to a conclusion of this show, and it's been another nice week. And We've actually, been busy. It's been a nice week, but if you guys want to keep looking at cool stuff online for this weekend, the ADEX show, which is normally a, a live show in Singapore, it's Singapore's biggest uh, dive show, dive show and uh, annual dive show, three-day dive show. But this year, they've actually decided to do it online. They've always got an amazing lineup of speakers and things like that so uh tune into the adex if you if you're not uh with them on facebook go and just simply look for adex and you can watch a, a lot of live presentations all weekend long should be a, a really good initiative i think it's great that they're thinking outside the box and putting it online yeah because none of us can go so it's a great way of doing it Yes, and uh, lots of uh, very interesting guests there exactly. too. Okay, but Alex, make sure to watch us live. Yes, and then watch us first. Yeah, <laughs> Alex Mustard, who was uh, who was on the show last week, he's uh, the master of ceremonies for for the photo stuff this week. So a lot of good, uh, a lot of interesting people, and some people on there who will be appearing on the show as yes. well. Yes, in the future, not this weekend. Yes, and 
Again, Monday, we're going to talk about Raja Ampat. It will be myself and Mike. We're going to explore uh, some of our favorite sites over there yeah. and some places that we've been diving there since uh, many okay. years. Maybe uh, not everybody dives in there. We will not give out too much of that information. We won't give up our secret sites. We're no, not putting no. any GPS points yes, on No there. points, but we're going to say that site is fantastic and it's great. And look what you can see. <laughs> and then uh, also we're going to have on Wednesday, Jason Isley from uh, Scuba Zoo. That also, he made a fantastic interview with us. Yep. And then uh, on Friday, we're going to bring you Douglas uh, Seifert, uh, 20 years uh, as 20, a... 25. 20, sorry, 25 years as an underwater photography journalist. Good insight from both yes. of them. Yes, and I have to say, both guests coming up next week didn't hold back. No. No. Some no. controversial statements. Yes. They were unleashed, uncensored. And Jason will be bringing his toys as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. If you were watching us on YouTube, thank you to watch that who have watched us there, please stay tuned in YouTube because we have less view on YouTube. On Facebook is going quite uh, better. It's going really well. It's going very well and we have lots of interaction. Thank you, everyone. Keep both channels on and then uh, join the interaction on Facebook that seems like to be more active over there, right? It certainly is. Yes. And if you would like to support uh, our channel uh, during uh, this time, uh, we put uh, some link in the description and uh, it's... Uh, Nothing that you have to do, but uh, we appreciate, of course, uh, if uh, you're going to get us a coffee, right? We certainly do. Yes, and that's, uh, I think, a nice, uh, funny it way to support. It makes us more caffeinated the during the day, so we got more energy yes. to, to, to present the show. Talking of energy yes. and uh, watching actually the energy happening during the show, we figured it out that this time is the best uh, to actually make our live shows. Yep. And we will now, from now on, Monday, Wednesday and Friday is going to be at the same very time that we did today. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Uh, Bali time. And don't forget to check in on our Facebook page because ahead of every show, we're going to put you all your GMT so that you can uh, make sure to catch us live. Yes. All right, guys. Uh, have a lovely weekend. Uh, do something nice. Uh, now there is no more. Don't stay on Facebook anymore because <laughs> we are not going to be there. Okay. So disconnect that uh, phone and start to do something. Fun. Fun. There you go. Yes. All right. See you guys. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.